The topic that has been selected for tonight's lecture is a very important topic and that because of two reasons. It is a topic which deals with the very essence of Islam. It is also a topic about which there is the emergence of continuous and progressive misunderstanding, especially in this present age. <coughs> There are people among Muslims who give due importance to the Sabbath and there are, there are also people who condemn it outright as something which is un-Islamic, something which is a foreign importation into Islam. In this connection, there have been two contributing causes. Yeah, I, I mean to say that in, in connection with the notion that the Sabbath is something alien to Islam, there have been two contributing causes. One cause uh, is based on the work of the Western Orientalists whose role has always been and is even now 
to misguide the Muslims. They misguide the Muslims with a flare of scholarship and they try to state things about Islam in a manner in which a person who is not well versed in Islam is bound to be misled. They have been doing it in connection with the life and the personality of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam because they know as enemies of Islam that if the loyalty which the Muslims have for the person of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is damaged then the religious enthusiasm or the enthusiasm of Muslims for Islam will also gradually vanish. And consequently you will find in their writings that they concentrate mostly on trying to pick up arguments against the greatness of the Holy Prophet Muhammad then their next target is Tasawwuf because if the Muslims are misguided in this connection, if they are made to believe that Islam is merely a ritualistic code of life, then the next step actually is atheism. Because the human beings cannot stand by any code of life, even though it may be called a divine code of life, until and unless they get something in, in terms of experience. They have something which touches them in the inner self and binds them to that thing. So, this intrigue is there and many of those who have been influenced by the writings of Western Orientalists have honestly or otherwise uh, tried to convince the Muslims through their writings and through their preachings that the subwoof is something which is alien to Islam. The next contributory factor in this connection is the practice of the subwoof in the Muslim world. In connection with this practice I consider it my duty to say and to affirm with all the force at my command that the service today unfortunately has degenerated. And it is very difficult to find it in that original form in which it was given. And therefore the ground is supplied by those who misuse this word and this ground is the most potent ground. This community here is a small community but I know those communities which are the larger ones like the community in Pakistan, the Muslim community of Pakistan and I know about my country how how this noblest of pursuits has been commercialized, how this noblest of pursuits has been ritualized, how this noblest of pursuits has been degraded by many a person who claims to be the Murshid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines the functions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. The functions for which he was sent by God Almighty. The first function that has been mentioned here is 
یتلو علیہم آیاتی ہی کمیونیکیٹ دی میسج آف دی ہولی قرآن ایز اٹ کمس ٹو ہم فرام گاڈ دیٹ از دی فرسٹ ون ہی گیوز ٹو دی پیپل دی لا ہی گیوز ٹو دی پیپل دی شریعہ ہی گیوز ٹو دی پیپل دی کوڈ آف لائف کنویز ٹو دیم ایز اٹ ہیز بین ریویل ٹو ہیم بائی گاڈ یتلو علیہم آیاتی This is the communication of the message. Then the second function is وَيُزَكِّ him and he purifies him and he comes. He purifies those who accept that message. So the process of purification is something different from learning the Sharia or the Code of Life. Because here is wow, and the word and, wow is wow of us, it stands for conjunction, and these are two different things. Tulawatul ayat is one, Tazkiya is another. Then his third function is, Yalimuhu al-Kitab, he teaches the meaning, he expounds that which has been given in the Holy Qur'an in order that people may be able to understand it better. Then his fourth function is يُعَلِّمُهُمْ الْحِكْمَةِ The verse is يُعَلِّمُهُمْ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Now here Al-Kitab and Al-Hikmah have been separated from one another again by this vow. They are two different things. He teaches Al-Kitab or the book and he teaches Al-Hikmah or the wisdom. <coughs> In this short space of time that I have at my disposal, I would try to give you things in a scholarly manner but very in a very simplified form so that you can understand them all. The first problem which emerges in the mind of every serious human being in connection with religion is the problem why religion? Every human being who is serious about the facts of his life and about the problems of his life, the first question that emerges in his mind is why religion? Then the second question, if this question is answered to his satisfaction that he should have a religion, then the next question arises, which religion? Because there are so many of them. And every one of them claims to be true and says that the others are false. Now, When the answer comes to him that the religion which he should adopt and which he should consider as true and genuine and as from God, that religion is Islam. Then arises the third question. What is Islam? And when this question arises, Here he is face to face with the problem of Asharia. What is the code of life that Islam has prescribed? Now the first two problems are problems of Al-Hikmah. They are the basic problems because unless a person knows what is the objective for which he should be a Muslim, It is absolutely useless for him to be a Muslim, to be called a Muslim. Unless he knows what is the objective, unless he knows what is the goal, unless he knows what is the path that leads to that goal, just to call himself Muslim nominally or formally or even to indulge in certain forms of ritualism would not lead him to that goal for which Islam came. So the first step, the first two questions, why religion 
and which religion do the steps are covered by al hikmah then what is islam is covered by a sharia or the law then another very important question arises this is islam but how to be a muslim that is the most important question of one's life just to know what are the teachings of islam doesn't help a person who does not know how to behave as a muslim and how to proceed on that path person may know all about the sharia he he may even be an alim but the holy quran in the same surah al jumu'ah we have been told about the ulama of the jews mathalu alladhina hummilu at-tawrata thumma lam yahmiluha kamathali al-himari yahmilu asfara the example of those who learned the tawrah who learned the sharia but could not assimilate and absorb it in their personalities for transformation of their personalities is the example of a donkey carrying a load of books we are the words of the quran and consequently this problem becomes the most important problem how to be a muslim because every human being is all the time beset and confronted with obstacles obstacles that arise from within the human self from the carnal self or the basic self basal self which has been called in islamic terminology, terminology as an nafsul ammara or the carnal self this carnal self is all the time sending out obstacles which try to obstruct the path of the human being in all his pursuits that are of a higher nature then there are obstacles in the environment in the social order or the group or the community in which a man is placed he has got to fight against both of these and unless he can fight successfully he cannot be a muslim in the real sense of the word he may know as much as he might know about islam that this is the sharia consequently for answering this question there should be a methodology there should be a methodology whereby the sharia can be employed for transforming the human personality in accordance with the objective of islam and therefore you hear the word at-tariqa at-tariqa al-qadiriyah at-tariqa al-tusiyah at-tariqa al-shadiliyah at-tariqa al-sohrawardiyah and so on this at-tariqa actually is methodology and answers that problem how to be a muslim then another question emerges if i succeed if a human being succeeds in becoming a muslim in accordance with what islam wants what will be the consequences what is the reward because that is human nature a human being cannot act for anything unless you tell him that there is a reward for it he will never act unless this thing is told so the question again becomes very important suppose i become a muslim in the genuine sense of the word what is the reward now this reward according to islam is in terms of the basic pursuit of man as he is born and the, the moment the human baby starts acquiring con- consciousness 
the human baby wants to know. And all this effort in education, whether it is the home education or education at the school, this is directed to this basic pursuit of the human personality that it wants to know. And it wants to know more and more and better and better and clearer and clearer. So this reward has been placed here also. If you adopt a tariqah, if you adopt the methodology, then you are rewarded with al-ma'rifah, knowledge, knowledge in depth. There is one thing which is called ilm, al-ilm, that is knowledge. There is another thing which is called al-irfan. Al-irfan is the superior degree of knowing. It is called realization and realization is beyond the concept of knowledge, above the concept of knowledge. So the reward is al-ma'rifah or acquiring the irfan knowing things as they are, not as they appear to be. Now this, this Al-Irfan has three levels. The first level is that a man should know himself. Charity should begin at home. Instead of trying to know other things which are beyond man, Islam says first of all know thyself. Knowledge should begin from here. So the marifa or the irfan or the realization, the first stage when a person becomes a Muslim and cultivates himself as a Muslim, and remember that a Muslim is a progressive being and evo evolutionary being. When a person walks on that path, adopts the methodology, then he gets this knowledge about himself. Then the second stage is to, to have the knowledge of the world or his environment, which is called by the Sufis as Ilmul Afaq. The first is called Ilmul Nafs, the knowledge of the self. The second is called Ilmul Afaq or the knowledge of the cosmos. This environment he, in which he is born and where he lives and where he acts. The third stage is to know God in terms of Irfan, to experience Him in a manner which can bring a conviction that cannot be shaken. A conviction which is above the argumentations of logic. A, a conviction which is based on direct experience. Just as a person when he sees the sun shining on the sky, you may bring as many arguments as you, as you please to try to convince him that it is not the sun which is shining. He will simply smile and say, no, you are trying to misguide me. This is the worth and virtue and value of direct experience. And the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam has said, Nothing is more valuable than direct experience. He says, لَيْسَ الْخَبَرُ كَالْمُعَائِنَ Report of knowledge which a person gets from a teacher and reads in the book, that cannot create that conviction in a person's mind as his personal experience and observation can create. So this direct experience of God and when this experience of God comes as the final fruit or the final reward of being a Muslim and cultivating oneself as a Muslim, then the stage arrives, the fifth stage, that is the stage of Al-Haqiqah. The pilgrim of eternity who started from his own self has and, and undertook this journey 
this journey into the infinite arrives at God, arrives at his goal. As the Holy Quran says, Anna ila rabbikal muntaha, unto thy Lord is thy goal. Now, because God is infinite, therefore the, in, the experience of God has infinite possibilities. Or, if you cannot understand this word of philosophy, infinite gradations. As we have been taught that there are millions and millions of hijabats or screens or obstacles or the intermediary void between man and God. In spite of the fact that God is nearer to every human being than his jugular way. Now this, this journey is journey in, in experience. This journey is journey in direct, under, understanding of God as to what God is and what connection I have with Him. What is my relationship with Him. So just as there are five foundations of Islam, according to the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, bunyal islam wa ala khamsin, Islam has been founded on five things. Kalimat al-Shahada, the daily obligatory prayers, fasting during the month of Ramadan, paying zakat if it is due, and performing the hajj if it is due. Similarly, these five pillars are there through which a Muslim has got to pass in order to be a Muslim. Al-Hikmah, al-Shari'a, al-Tariqa, al-Ma'ifah, al-Hakiqah. Now, this, this thing about which I have emphasized is as, as al-Tariqah, about, about that we find the authority of the Qur'an. In the Holy Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa uh, 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 he, he says in the Holy Quran, Mukullin ja'alna minkum shir'atam wa min haja. He has prescribed for every community a sharia or a code of life and a minhaj or a methodology. And the function of this methodology is what has been said about the functions of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu was salam at or purification of the human personality. Now try to understand another thing, my dear friend, about this purification as to what it means. According to the Holy Quran, every human being was created in the garden of bliss Jannah. It was not only Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam or Sayyidatuna Hawa alayhi salam that only these two beings were created in that transcendental world which is called Al Jannah and which is very different from this world about which I might just say that that world is a spaceless and uh, timeless world while this world is a special and temporal world. Every human being was born there, was created there, I should say, Ali Bala. It means that all human beings were existing there and they were not only existing there but they also possessed consciousness because if they had not possessed consciousness they would not have been able to understand what God said and would not have been able to answer. This further means that the essential or the real human being is not this physical being. The real human being in which consciousness and every faculty exists is that spaceless, timeless human being 
that essential human being who has been called in the Holy Quran as Ar-Ruh. Ar-Ruh. Ar-Ruh is wrongly translated as the soul. Ar-Ruh is wrongly translated as the spirit. Ar-Ruh, according to the Arabic language, is the essential being. The essential human being. This essential human, every human being, in his capacity as the essential human being was created by Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala in the garden of bliss. In the transcendental world which is spaceless and timeless and consequently this being is also spaceless and timeless. Then the command was given, it appears as if they were in a queue. So Adam and Eve came first and when they procreated their first child came, the second one came, and the human beings have been coming under that one command, Ehlutu Minha Jamiya. And these human beings have been traversing God knows best millions of years or billions of years or trillions of years, we don't know. In an infinite span of space and time, they have been continuously traveling in order to emerge here on the earth at the appointed time. So when the human beings emerge here on the earth, what takes place according to Quranic theology is that this essential being, when it is captured in the environment of space and time, projects itself in space and time. This is what Maulana Jalaluddin al-Rumi rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi said. He says, Paikar, Paikar, as ma has should nay ma azu. This body is the projection of our essential being. It's not that the essential being depends on this body. Now, when this essential human being projects itself in the spatio-temporal dimensions, its first projection is in terms of mind. Mind is temporal and non-spatial. Mind is not something which is occupied by space or which occupies space. Mind exists only in time. It is only temporal. So the first projection is from the final to the coarser. And this spaceless, timeless being projects itself in terms of time and in terms, consequently in terms of mind. Then its final projection is, its final projection is as a spatial temporal being. Try to take help from science and you will find it. Try to think about everything that exists in this world, for instance a flower. Try to trace the origin of a flower. The origin in human experience is that one day a very small point emerges on the twig of a certain plant. A very small point. Then this small point expands, develops, and ultimately after a number of days it becomes the bud. And then this bud develops and one day it smiles into a thousand petal flower. It is the same point which had emerged, which could be seen only with a microscope, not even with the naked eye. Now consequently, before its emergence as a point on the twig of the tree, it must have been something finer, because its progress has been towards coarser and coarser stages of existence. So here, this body, 
before it assumes even the form of the life germ or the sperm as it is called the sperm lives in the body of the male of the husband the ovum lives in the body of the female and when the sperm fertilizes the ovum then they get the zygote as it is called that alak which the holy 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 book calls it a uh, uh, it will be called clot but this sperm is something physical although the sperm is so tiny that you cannot see it except through a very powerful microscope but even this is something physical there is something before that when this when this is sperm is only something mental it is the first projection in the spatio temporal world of this essential being whose abode is in al janna and who has traveled for countless period of time through infinite space under that command of god which was given at the dawn of creation ehi tu min ha dunya so here this human being lives and acts and when the time of death comes death does not mean annihilation death does not mean termination of existence death only means transfer from one level of existence to another level as a matter of fact this human being who is said to be born here under those before coming into this world numberless births, births and numberless deaths and every death for this human being is the stage for further evolution before every new emergence before every emergence on a higher plane on a new plane this essential human being has to be incubated it has to pass through the stage of incubation we know about the first grave and also about the second grave grave the qabr the first grave is in the mother's body where it stays for 9 months and incubates when the sperm fertilizes the ovum and zygote is formed then the zygote starts developing into the embryo and it changes its form it is like a small crocodile a small crocodile with all that punch and, and all that ugliness and it gradually changes and changes and changes until it assumes the form of a human baby and when it has matured then the period of incubation or staying in the barzakh in alamul barzakh inside the mother's body inside that grave that period ends and it it is ushered in into the world when it acts here in terms of space and time as a moral being and particip- participates in the human civilization then it is again sent to the grave it is again sent to the grave and it will stay in their grave until the day of qiyamah don't think that this grave this uh, uh, grave made of up the word qabr which has been used in islamic theology it stands for this type of earthly grave only secondarily the word qabr originally is a sort of syndrome is a sort of shell in which it exists just as the sperm goes into the mother's womb and that is a shell where it stays 
and where it under under undergo numerous changes and evolves. So this is the, this is called Hayatul Barzakhiya, that it remains alive. It remains in a process of experience in accordance with what it has done in this world. And then on the day of Qiyamah, the next stage will come. As the Holy Quran says, that every human being, his constitution will be changed. The constitution of the earth will be changed and the constitution of all human uh, of all heavenly heavenly bodies will be changed. I mean, say, if you find things here as spatial, temporal, or physical, or earthly, or material, there you will find them on another plane. Perhaps I have gone in this field too far. I should come back to the original topic. But why I spoke on this is that this thing has got to be understood by all those who talk in favor or against Tathabu. What the Holy Quran wants us to do is, and what the Holy Prophet wasalam, wants us to do, is this. What the Holy Quran wants us to do is, and what the Holy Prophet wasalam, wants us to do, is this. The Holy Prophet wasalam, has taught us, إن الله خلق آدم على صورته. Allah created Adam or the human being in his, in his image. What does it mean? It means that Allah placed in him those qualities which he possesses infinitely, placed those qualities in him encased by his finite youth. Inna Allah khalaqa Adama ala surat. Now when this spaceless and timeless being who is originally citizen of Al-Jannah, of the transcendental world, the world of purity and holiness and bliss. Now when this comes here, because it is created being, and like all other created things, it has a shadow. It has a shadow. It is composed of light and darkness. It is composed of two principles which are opposite to one another. It is composed of what the Holy Quran says, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا God has placed two principles in the human being. The principle of fujur and the principle of taqwa. Man has the capacity of either pursuing the path of evil or pursuing the path of good. He is not like angels who can pursue only the path of good. He is not like Iblis who can pursue only the path of evil. He is between the angel and the Iblis. He combines the qualities of both. He combines the light of, from which angels are made, were made by God, and he combines the darkness which is represented by Iblis. Now the purpose for which he has been sent here is to participate in the struggles which are here. This world is the world of struggle in every domain to participate here. The message of Islam is that he should participate here as a servant of God, as the upholder of absolute righteousness because God is the embodiment or God is the personification of all that is good because God is absolute good. Because God is absolute good, so when he 
created the human being in his image this human being originally is also good without an add mixture of evil this evil comes as a shadow that when light is cast somewhere in the spatio temporal dimension then this light must give birth to a shadow also this evil is the negative aspect of the human faculties remember this now when the human being comes here the message of islam is what the holy prophet alayhi salatu wassalam has taught and which is quoted very often but i don't know how many muslims really understand its meaning he says takhallaqu bi akhlaqillah imbue yourselves with divine attributes what does it mean how can we do it we are creatures we have been created by god god is creator he is infinite we are finite he is absolute good we are not absolute good now remember another hadith also and also the verse from the quran in connection with the proof for what i am saying the holy quran says laqad khalaqna al insana fi ahsan taqwim most surely i have created the human being in the best of make in the best constitution but this human being is also capable of sinking to the lowest of the low summa radadnahu asfal safilin illa alladhina amanu wa amilus salihat this is the message of islam to have this iman and amal salih but does this iman and amal salih means that iman and amal salih which we are demonstrating no that iman and amal salih which was demonstrated by the holy prophet muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam it is at that level that the human being regains his original purity he is born a pure being remember this because there is the hadith wherein the holy prophet alayhi salatu wassalam says kullu mauludin yuladu ala al fitrah aw ala al islam every child who is born is born on his original nature the original nature is that of purity because he was created in the garden of bliss every human being is born pure and holy because he belongs to a world which is pure and and holy does not belong to this earth he does not originally belong to the earth he only emerges here during his vast journey which he was ordered to undertake at the dawn of creation and if that journey be conceived according to our imagery because a human can a human being can conceive things only in concrete terms then we might say that the journey of the essential human being from al janna is in a circle it is in the form of a circle and as if this earth is just blow al janna so when a human being arrives here then he has traversed half of that circle now the in that half of circle it is the condition of khubu descent descend ilbitu descend so it descends under the divine command eh it is descent then there is the ascent it has to go back there so the ideal in islam has been given beware beware what should be your motto of life the motto of life should be inna lillahi our existence our everything is only for allah subhanahu wa taala 
because he created us in his image we cannot do for anything else inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun and now this part of the journey which remains is the journey of return at the other arm of that circle again to that about where he had created us so when the holy prophet alayhi salatu wassalam commands us takhallaqu bi akhlaqillah in these words what he means thereby is not that we should try to become god which no one can become even he was not god and could never be god he was only al insanul kamil perfect man the function of this ordinance is that we should try to maintain our purity which is originally ours our holiness which is originally ours because we were created in a holy abode or in a holy region which is called al janna and because when the human beings come here in this world very very naturally they are enticed and fascinated by this world by things which take away from human being his innocence which take away from the human being his beauty his beauty of the inner self his moral purity his spiritual purity in terms of being slave of god he tries to become slave besides god of other things also and when he does this then he is unloyal to his pledge which he had given on the day of dawn of creation when he had said anta rabbuna when allah subhanahu wa taala had told him alastu bi rabbikum he said bala anta rabbuna thou art our lord now this was the pledge this was the pledge at the start of the journey and consequently man is bound by his pledge and in order to remain loyal to his pledge he has got to strive all the time in order to acquire what has been called in the holy quran an nafsul mutmainna he stays here in this environment but the person who is really a mu'min who has the iman in god while he stays here as a, a sufi has said dil bayar dast bakar his outer senses and his outer and his organs remain engaged in things of this world but his heart remains engaged with god you see this is the goal and for this the problem arises how can this tazkiya be performed this tazkiya which has been given in the holy quran as the function of the holy prophet muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam that he purified those human beings who became his followers how can it be performed now because unless it is it is performed unless we are muzakka unless we attain or we regain our original holiness then we are in trouble then our road there will be a dual road going there you see one leading to al janna and the other leading to the jahannam then we are going on the road which leads to jahannam this is a very important point and consequently you will find 
that when in the early history of Islam, Muslims acquired enormous wealth and enormous power. They became money drunk, wealth drunk and power drunk. That was natural. So if you read the cultural history of Islam, you will find this, <coughs> that when the seat of the empire was transferred from Medina, Medina al Munawwara to Syria and later on to Baghdad. The original purity of Islam and Islamic way of life was progressively damaged. And Muslims started behaving towards Islam only in terms of ritualism. God has made it obligatory that we should pray five times a day. We are praying five times a day. We have done our duty. Why should we pray? That was not the question for them anymore. Or what the Quran had told them, that was not the real, real problem for them. And even the ulama of those days, many of them became material, materialistically minded. Of course, history has told us about so many ulama who were purchased by the various governments that came into being. The ulama are not angels, they are human beings. And when this thing was taking place, then from among the ulama, there was a large group who said, this Muslim community is going to lose its future. It is becoming more and more earth rooted. It is becoming less and less godly. Its aim and objective no more remains pleasure of God, but pleasure of the ego and of the carnal self. And therefore we should do something. So this movement came. Tasabuf, as it is called. Don't go into whether it is from Suf or it is from Safa. Safa. Purity. But its objective was clearly laid down. Unfortunately, we do not possess any writing from Sayyidina Hassan al-Basri, who is considered to be the founder of this movement. But the earliest writings of those days are Qutul Qulu by Abu Talib Makki and Al-Risalatul uh, Qushariya. Uh, uh, these two books are the earliest on Sufi. And what I am saying here is proof when we read those books. And this has been the goal of this movement. To uh, make an endeavor to make Muslims as genuine Muslims with all that the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam stands for. Try to Read those books which were compiled long after that. Try to read Futuhul Ghaib by Ghosul Azam Sayyid Abdul Qadir al Jilani or Khudur Rabban by the same, by the uh, same person. Or read <coughs> Awariful Ma'arif by Sheikh Shahabuddin Thorawad. Or read at Ta'aruf by Abu Bakr al-Qalabazi or read Kashful Mahjub by Shaykh Ali Khufir. Read any work which has been compiled on this by those who are classical masters. And what you will find is that they base their entire doctrine, their entire code on the Sharia. Sayyidina Ghosul Azam, the founder of the Qadri order, says 
that for a spiritual pilgrim, the Sharia stands at the beginning, the Sharia stands in the middle, the Sharia stands at the end. He cannot go one hair's breadth out, out of the Sharia. This is the Sabbath. Of course, <clears throat> there have been mystical schools. There have been mystical schools of thought. There have been mystical movements and mystics among Christians, among the Buddhists, among the Hindus. And Muslims were bound to come into contact with them. And they were bound to come into contact with Muslims. And many of those people embraced Islam and became members of the Muslim community. Now, this thing is developed highly in Hinduism and Buddhism especially. They have got all their philosophy and science of yoga and this and that. And when these Hindu yogis, Buddhists and other mystics came into the fold of Islam, they tried to maintain and retain some of their old practices and things. And consequently you will find different movements, mystical movements in Islamic history. For instance, the movement of Yakhwan Safa. This was the movement of the Batumiya. Or the movement of the Aramita, carrying Muslim names and the label of Islam. But Islam's scholars and Sufis fought tooth and nail against them. It is very wrong to say that they were condoned. They were never condoned. For instance, read Al Muntiz Min Abdalal by uh, Abu Hamid Muhammad Al Ghazali, Rahmatullahi Taala. And there you will find his full discourse on the Batuniya. Or read his Ihya and you will find a full refutation of all the doctrines which became in vogue in those days under the name of Islamic Sufism. Adoption of the Islamic Sharia has degenerated with the degeneration of the Muslims. Similarly, the Sufi orders have also degenerated. I as a world tourist and I as a member of the Qadri order, if I have to be truthful, and I should be truthful, I must make this statement. Tasavvuf began originally as a revolt against hollow and shallow ritualism. That was the beginning. But today you will find it ritualism through and through as if the real pursuit in death is not. So many rituals. Baba, oh Muslims, you have already got so many in the Sharia. Why add to them? What is the need for all this? Absolutely no need. You may read the works of these ancient masters and you will find them dealing with, for instance, Sunuku Salat, Sunuku Saum. How to develop a methodology on the basis of this Salat which has been made obligatory in the Sharia. How to develop a methodology on the basis of that song which has been prescribed in the Sharia. You will find them talking like that. And they always talk on the basis of the Holy Quran and the Sunnah. I may give you a story of my own family. Among my great-great uh, grandfathers there was a great 
Sufi and also a very eminent alim of his time. He was considered to be the imam of his age. His name was Sheikh al-Islam Abdullah al-Ansari. Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. He belonged to Herat. His father was governor of Afghanistan and he led his life purely as a, an Islamic reformer. In those days, Allama ibn Taymiyyah had already been born and Allama ibn Taymiyyah raised a masculine voice against Sufi. His pupil, who was an intellectual giant, Ibn Qayyim, who was a greater intellectual giant than his master, Ibn Taymiyyah, he challenged the whole world of Islam, the ulama of the world of Islam, to prove that the Sufi way of life had anything to do with Islam. His contention was that it is absolutely anti Islamic or un-Islamic it is, is only an importation. When he raised this challenge in Egypt, he was directed by the ulama there and the ulama in other countries, in Syria and so on, to go and meet this man, Shaykh al-Islam Abdullah al-Ansari. So he came to him. And he asked him the question in, in Herat, in Afghanistan, he asked if the real pursuit in death is not. So many rituals. Baba, O oh Muslims, you have already got so many in the Sharia. Why add to them? What is the need for all this? Absolutely no need. You may read the works of these ancient masters and you will find them dealing with, for instance, Sulukus Salat, Sulukus Saum. How to develop a methodology on the basis of this Salat which has been made obligated that you might get some help from the Hadith or from Aqwal Sahaba or from the Aqwal of Tabi'een and so on. But Shaykh islam said, all right, you come to me tomorrow morning. And in the night he wrote his book, which is a uh, unique work on this, two reasons. It is called Manazilus Sa'irin. Manazilus Sa'irin. The stations of the, uh, uh, of those who undertake the spiritual journey. He wrote this book purely and solely on the basis of the Qur'an. He has not quoted a single hadith or anything and proved entire system of the Sufi way of life from the Qur'an. He gave it to Ibn Qayyim next morning when he came and he told him, please study this. It is a book of about 36 pages on a small size. Study this. And whatever objections you may feel, come to me at your leisure. You may take one week or two weeks or one day or two days or one month or two months as you please. So Ibn Qayyim came to him after about a month's time and uh, accepted him as his murshid, made the tawbah, and it is this Ibn Qayyim who wrote a voluminous commentary on this Manazil Sairin by the name of Madari Salikin, which is a voluminous commentary of about 1,000 pages. So actually, if we study the history of Islam deeply, and if we try to understand as to how this move, movement arose, and what foundations it had, what philosophy it has, and whether that philosophy is actually guaranteed by the Qur'an, and by the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, then all these doubts must vanish. I hope 
that what I have said tonight, of course, it is now quite some time. What I have said tonight, I have tried to make it very simple and easy. It has depth, but I have tried to state it in a very simple manner. The subwoof is nothing else than the effort to fulfill that mission of the Holy Spirit, which has been mentioned as the mission of Tazkiyah, or which has been mentioned in the Hadith as Al-Ihsan, beautification of Islam, to beautify Islam, and there the Holy Prophet says, what is Al-Ihsan? To rise, to cultivate one's consciousness in terms of slavery to God, in being Abdullah, in this Abdiyah. To uh, cultivate this consciousness to a level where the Holy Prophet والسلام, says, فَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ Serve thy Lord as if thou art seeing him and then serving him. And so long as this may not be possible, the minimum demand of Islam is that thou should serve thy Lord with the consciousness that God is seeing thee and thou art worshipping him. With these words, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he may enable all Muslims to see the truth and to walk on the way of truth and to extricate themselves from misconceptions based on ignorance, whether they are opponents of the Sufi way of life or they are, or they are up, upholders of this way of life. May Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala make us mutamassikina bil kitabi wa sunnah. Because in that alone lies our salvation, in that alone lies all the, all blessings and all that we can get from God Almighty. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.